Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, I think we're going to start the final uh, panel session of the afternoon. Thank you all very much for having the stamina to stay through this far. I think this coming session on loss and damage is just so important and it is pivotal to the debate that we're having about climate change because we are seeing the impacts of climate change already. And this session will give some of the most vulnerable countries, most affected, uh, a chance to have their say. Throughout today already, we have heard the anger from developing countries in what they see as a lack of urgency on the part of the developed world, who at the end of the day are the people who are responsible for uh, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere today. And their lack of urgency in taking the issue seriously enough has to date um, been frustrating. I think the message is now getting through and I hope very much that at the end of this COP, we will have a far greater sense of urgency from the, developing, uh, from the developed world. So this session today, we're going to really talk a little bit and hear from the real experts in the field. We're going to look at some of the evidence behind some of the reporting from the IPCC, and we're going to hear from three countries, representatives of three countries who are on the front line of climate change. Um, our first speaker is an eminent French climate scientist and research director at the French Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Commission, where she works in the Climate and Environment Sciences Laboratory. She uses data from historic climate records to test models of climate change. And um, as I said, we've heard quite a lot to alarm us in the recent IPCC reports. Um, so it's going to be, I think, really useful to hear insights from someone who contributes regularly to IPCC reports. And I'd really like you to give your warmest welcome to Professor Valerie masson Delmotte co-chair of the work group one of the IPCC. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity to share some of the key findings from the 2021 IPCC climate report. And I will focus on the physical science basis of climate change that can be relevant for your thematic debate on loss and damage. Where are we now? It's now an established fact that human activities have warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land, leading to widespread, rapid and intensifying changes, including loss of snow and ice. The magnitude and scale of current changes are unprecedented over thousands of years. The level of global warming is now reaching 1.1 degrees Celsius for the last decade compared to the late 19th century. It's now unequivocal that all of this warming is human-caused, resulting from heat-trapping greenhouse gases, partly masked by the cooling effect from short-lived pollution particles. As a result, the ocean is warming with more frequent marine heat waves. It's acidifying, losing oxygen, and this drives shifts in marine species. Overland, warming is faster than the global average, Climate zones are shifting, also driving shifts in terrestrial species. We observe a decrease in available water during dry seasons in the majority of the land area, because with warmer air, there's more evaporation and plant transpiration. An important advance is the um, fact that human-caused climate change is already affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways, especially through the strengthening 
of the frequency and intensity of hot extremes, heavy rainfall events, droughts in some regions, fire weather, and compound flooding. The global proportion of Category 3-5 tropical cyclones has increased, and human-induced climate change has increased heavy precipitation from these tropical cyclones. We've also set in motion the slow components that will adjust over decades or more for glaciers, centuries for the deep ocean, and thousands of years for ice sheets. The rate of sea level rise has accelerated, and sea level is committed to continue to rise over hundreds of years. The changes we are already experiencing will increase with further warming. So where are we go going? Future warming depends on future emissions, and every ton of CO2 emitted in the atmosphere adds to warming. We expect global warming to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius, averaged over 20 years, in the next 20 years. If greenhouse gas emissions remain close to today's levels just during a few decades, then two degrees of global warming could be reached by the 2050s. However, if rapid and deep reductions in carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse emissions are achieved in the coming years, decades, it is possible to limit global warming well below two degrees, and only with very strong reductions close to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Why does every increment of further warming matter? Many changes in the climate become larger in direct relation to the level of warming. For every half a degree of increase in global warming, there will be clear further increases in regional warming, contrasted regional precipitation changes, increases in the frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation and hot extremes, including the number of days above harmful heat thresholds, droughts in some regions, the proportion of intense tropical cyclones. A warmer climate intensifies the water cycle and its variability, including very wet and very dry events and seasons. A warmer climate affects the ocean in multiple ways that are important for marine life and people who depend on it. This includes further intensified marine heat waves, loss of oxygen, and acidification. We show clearly how these multiple changes are more pronounced, more widespread for every increment of warming, and how they can be stopped by limiting warming. Limiting warming would also allow to slow and limit the magnitude and the rate of sea level rise, giving more time to adapt in low-lying coastal zones where sea level rise increases the frequency and severity of coastal flooding and coastal erosion. What will you find that could be relevant for the place where you live in our report? An interactive atlas where you can have access to the information, make your own maps, explore the characteristics of changes where you live, and see the synthesis of climatic impact drivers which we know already affect societies or ecosystems as a function of the level of warming of the time horizon. So the key message is that with further warming, every region will increasingly experience concurrent and multiple specific changes in multiple climatic impact drivers. For instance, 50% of regions would experience by a level of 2 degrees changes in 15 climatic impact drivers and 96% of the world regions in at least 10 of them. So you can use our new online interactive atlas to explore these changes in every region. And finally, from a physical science basis, what is needed to limit future warming? It requires limiting cumulative CO2 emissions, reaching at least net zero CO2 emissions, together with strong reductions in other greenhouse gas emissions. And we flag that strong, rapid, and sustained reductions in methane would also limit the warming effect resulting from pollution control, declining aerosol pollution, and would improve air quality as well. Within a few years, if emissions are decreased, there would be benefits for air quality. 
For global surface temperature trends, it would be seen within around 20 euros. So to conclude, our report shows clearly that the climate we experience in the future depends on our decisions now, and it provides a wealth of information to inform risk management strategies and adaptation action. Thank you. Valerie, thank you very much for giving us an insight into the work that the IPCC is doing and its findings. And I think the message comes through very clearly that we can do something about runaway climate change, but we have to act. We have to stop putting more carbon dioxide, more methane and other greenhouse gases into the air. And, um, and, but this is doable and uh, we really need to put pressure, this is me speaking now, on our political leaders because that is where the solution will lie. It is man-made and man can stop this. Um, before I introduce our next uh, speaker, can I just uh, say, just remind you all to please submit your uh, requests if you would like to um, say something, uh, contribute to this um, debate, either by a very short statement, no more than two minutes, and hopefully with a question attached, um, then we'll be do moving on to um, taking those contributions at the end of the panel uh, speeches. Um, so I'm, I'm now going to move on to our second speaker, and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing his contribution. He is a former prisoner of conscience who was subjected to detention and custodial violence. And yet, he went on to play a key role in groundbreaking legislation in Bangladesh on the criminalization of torture. He also helped promote a constitutional amendment to protect the environment and biodiversity and remains, he, he remains to this day active on climate change, refugee protection, disaster risk reduction, nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament and is a leading advocate for the sustainable development goals. And so it is with great pleasure that I ask Mr. Sabar Chaudhry, a former president, an honorary president indeed, of the IPU to give us a broad overview of the climate emergency in Bangladesh. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Chowdhury. Thank you so much, um, Baroness Sheehan, for that uh, very kind introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here with you today. Um, IPU is uh, an institution which is very close to my heart. And uh, this annual meeting of parliamentarians to coincide with COP um, is something that I found to be very useful. And this year, of course, we have the British group of the IPU uh, organizing the event in this uh, splendid and historic setting. Interestingly, I was just uh, looking up um, on the venue itself, and uh, there was an exhibition in the park next door in 1888, um, a year before the IU, uh, IPU was born. Uh, so this gives you uh, a chance to see what things looked like when the IPU started its journey. And it was from that exhibition that funds were raised. And then this uh, magnificent building was opened in uh, 1901. Um, let me very quickly uh, give you a brief overview of um, the, uh, how Bangladesh views the climate. Uh, we call it an emergency. We can call it catastrophe. We can call it change. Um, for Bangladesh, it's an existential crisis. You know, it's about surviving. It is not just about living with, uh, with damages. So it is about the very existence of Bangladesh. And when I tell you that a one meter rise in sea level is going to displace 40 million, four zero million people, and that too, who are the most uh, marginalized, who are the most poor, and that too in a country which is one of the most densely populated countries in the world, you have an idea of the, of the challenge. We will lose about 17% of uh, land. We will uh, lose uh, rice production by about 15%. Last year, the WMO has actually released some figures 
on the damage that natural hazards cause. And in Bangladesh, it was $11 billion. $11 billion just one year. So you can see that what sort of a challenge this is. And then if you look at a map of Bangladesh, you have got the Himalayas to the north and you've got the Bay of Bengal to the south. Uh, there is very strong glacial melt. The Himalayas are the water towers for South Asia. That's where we get 700, 800 million people get their fresh water supplies. So once the glaciers melt, where will you get your water supply? So you have water stress. How do you live without water? So these are all existential challenges that Bangladesh faces. And of course, on top of all of that, you have disasters. The frequency and the intensity have both increased. So an event that would occur maybe once every 10 years is now going to be with us maybe once every two or three years. And the damage is going to be far greater. So when you put all of these together, the Parliament of Bangladesh, in fact, took the view that it's not just a, a climate emergency, it's a planetary emergency. And the Bangladesh Parliament is the only parliament in the world to have actually adopted a planetary emergency. Because we see a number of, of crises which is in the horizon. Maybe by the time we are looking at 2040 or 2045, it'll be a perfect storm. So it's not just climate, but it's also a whole lot of other issues, including food security. And of course, the whole idea of planetary overshoot, which applies to every country. Uh, simply put, that means that the resources that we have available in any given year, we are actually utilizing that in seven to eight months. So the planetary overshoot day is moving forward. So that in itself is un unsustainable, because it means that you're soon going to need two planet Earths to, in fact, uh, meet our, our requirements. So that's how we, we see this. And um, so for us, it's absolutely fundamental that we cap temperature increase to 1.5. And remember, even at 1.5, the pain, the devastation, the loss is going to be immense. Uh, Valerie was just talking about 1.1 degrees. And think of what is happening all over the world, whether it's wildfires, whether it's droughts, whether it's floods, extreme temperatures. And just think what that will be, even if you are able to achieve 1.5. Currently, we are on track to achieve 2.7. That is if all of the pledges are met, which uh, I'm afraid to say and sad to say will not be met. So we are looking at an average increase of three degrees Celsius plus. And in some parts of Africa, it's going to be close to 4%, which means that ecosystems are going to be destroyed and livelihoods will be all over the place. So you can see why, why we are talking about an existential crisis. The other issue that has come to the forefront of the discourse, and which you as parliamentarians should be well aware of, is the issue of loss and damage. If you look at the UNFCCC treaty, because it is a treaty which all of the countries have signed, you'll see there is only one objective. It doesn't say objectives, it's not plural, it's singular. And what is that objective? It is to stop human interference with the climate system. And that is done by what? that is done by stabilizing greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. So we first started off, the entire UNFCCC movement started off by looking at mitigation. How can we reduce the level of emissions? Then we quickly realized in the early 2000s that that's not working, <clears throat> so we have to do something about adaptation because the damage, the harm was too great. And now after adaptation, I feel that we are now at the third cycle where we are looking at loss and damage. Loss and damage is something that you lose permanently. If you lose your property, if you lose your home, if you lose your life, that is a permanent damage. There is also the non-economic damage. Ancestors who have lived in the lands for centuries, and that land you cannot now share because you are displaced. You have to move somewhere else. So loss and damage has now become a highly topical issue. Unfortunately, it is not getting the traction, and I'm being very candid, because many countries feel, especially in the developed world, that if they accept loss and damage, then the issue of compensation and liability comes in. But that is a reality. If you believe in climate equity, if you believe in climate justice, that is something that we really have to address. So loss and damage is now also a major discourse in the conversation. I'm not sure how far we'll get uh, in COP26, 
But I think by the time we are in Egypt next year, that is probably going to take center stage. Uh, other than the 1.5, the other absolutely fundamental issues, I think, for developing countries, one is the funding, the financing. The 100 billion has not been met. In fact, when I looked at the last estimates, it's about 70 billion. And the agreed 50-50 split between adaptation and mitigation has not taken place. 80% of the funds have gone to mitigation. Only 20% has come to adaptation. And now we are talking about private funding. Remember, private capital is only encouraged and attracted by returns. It is very difficult to show returns on adaptation. Mitigation, of course, you put in a renewable energy plant, you get your money back. So for developing countries, finance, access to technology, it is absolutely critical. And also what we do with displacement as an extension of the Warsaw mechanism is also going to be very important. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sabra. That was um, um, thought-provoking, to say the least. Um, 40 million people, 40 million of the poorest people in the world will be displaced by, temperature, uh, by sea level rises of one meter. Um, that should give us all thought, um, something to think about. Um, Bangladesh is in an existential crisis, and it is trying to do its best, but it really does need the developed world to keep its promises and make sure that that trust between the rich and the poorest nations is strengthened. Um, we're going to move on to our third speaker this afternoon, and he is the Honorable Samuelu Penetala Teo. He is a member of Parliament of Tuvalu. He, he's been around in politics for a very, very long time, not least because his father was the first Governor General of Tuvalu after independence of Tuvalu from Great Britain. And so he's been in politics since 1998. He served in several ministerial posts, and in 2009 he was elected by Parliament as a Speaker of the Parliament. And in 2020, in the absence of the Governor General of Tuvalu, Honorable Teo was appointed as the acting Governor General of Tuvalu, a post that he held until September of this year. Now he's going to give us an overview of the implications of loss and damage resulting from the reduction of, of um, habitable land, including the existential impacts for the population of the most vulnerable island states. So please give um, Honourable Theo your warmest welcome. Uh, thank you, Chair, for those uh, remarks. And uh, I think I will uh, explain a little bit about my country, Tuvalu. Uh, Tuvalu is a very small country which you will hardly see on the map. It is about 600 miles north of uh, Fiji. And uh, the land area of Tuvalu totals only to a, a mere 26 square kilometers. And it's spread over nine islands. So each of the islands are very thin and long and uh, the population of my country is only about 11, 12,000 people, and we have uh, about three or 4,000 Tuvaluans living abroad in Auckland, New Zealand, and uh, these people are being brought over to New Zealand mainly because of this fate of climate change and the effects of it on this small island nation of Tuvalu. Like I said, Tuvalu is a very small country. Even on the main capital island where I live, we have about half of the population of Tuvalu, five, 6,000 people living on it. The islands are just like in the Maldives. They're only a couple of feet above sea level. So for sure, with the sea level rise coming into place, we are already affected. 
like what my prime minister said in the COP, that we need action. Because a sea level rise is happening right at our doorstep. The airfield, we have only one airport in Tuvalu. And the airfield at the highest tides, which we call the king tide, is about 40% of it is underwater. So you can imagine a plane landing on an airfield that has water on it. It's, uh, it's something that is not desirable. If we look at the, the climate pattern of Tuvalu, when I was a young boy, during my lifetime from 1957 to until 1972, there was only one hurricane that uh, came to Tuvalu. This was Hurricane BB in 1972. That hurricane caused one big tidal wave, which was more than 60 feet high. And this tidal wave hit the, the land and all the houses had to go with it. It left only three or four houses standing after the wave passed. All the co coconut trees and everything on the land were flat. They were all flattened by this only one wave. And during those days, cyclones were very rare. Maybe one cyclone in 30 years. But now, every Christmas, beginning from October to January or February, we have three, four, five cyclones per year. Before it was one cyclone in 20 years. Now it's five, six cyclones every year. So there is a big change in the weather patterns of Tuvalu. And uh, the sea level rise is affecting our crops. We have uh, a kind of uh, potato which we call a pulaka, which is a giant uh, taro. This is the stable diet of my people. Now it is very hard to grow this, uh, this uh, giant uh, taro because the salt is entering into the sea into the water lenses. So it's very hard to plant. Now, people are beginning to plant on top of the soil. You cannot plant in the soil because the water there is full of salt because of the sea level rise. And these are the effects, the things that we are watching every day. And uh, we are actually seeing the real effects of climate change, of sea level rise. And before I came here, my 10-year-old grandson asked me, hey, when, when you go to that meeting in, in Scotland, are we going to be able to live in Tuvalu after you come back? I said, the answer depends on those big, rich nations who pollute the world with the coal that they burn and all that. And here we are in the Pacific Islands. We haven't contributed anything at all, hardly to the cause of these big changes in the climate change of the world. And we are paying the price of it. And I think one day we will be forced to migrate unless there is a form of adaptation which we have thought of, and that is to build up the elevation of my country. We have to dredge our lagoons and the oceans and build up the land to add on another meter or another two meters, and that will save us maybe for another century. But if we are going to go at this present going rate, we have to abandon ship. We have to go for the life rafts. So, 
my fellow parliamentarians. You can see on the video clips that are being shown around that there is an actual, a real, it's like a, you're about to face the end of the, the world, you know, with these, uh, the sea level rises, the real culprit in this, uh, in this uh, climate change dilemma. Another thing that I want to mention here is that this fund that they call Green Climate Fund, we had a, we applied for a funding under this uh, pool of fund, and we managed to get about 30 million American dollars back in 2016 to build a sea walls in my country because of that uh, we had a big cyclone about four or five years ago and we were going to build these sea walls. And we applied for this funding, we got the funding, but we have never seen even one brick being set up. The implementation has never been done. And we hear that the consultants who did all this uh, work are still working on consulting and chewing up all the money. And nearly half of the money is gone and still hasn't even reached our islands, you know, for one brick to be laid up, they're still drawing the, the diagram of the of the sea wall, how they're gonna build the sea wall. You know? I thought a sea wall, you know, doesn't need a, a, t a technical man to, you know, to to fix such a, it's not a building or it's just a sea wall. And I've told my fellow parliamentarians in parliament that the best sea wall I've ever seen in this world is the one that they build in Papiete, in Tahiti. And if you got a chance to go and see Tahiti, at the wharf there, you go and see the sea wall there. And it is so designed that the, when the wave comes, the wave just goes up with the slope of the, of the sea wall and goes back and hits the next wave that's coming in. I've told them that, but these consultants are still working on it, and they're still working on it. So I just don't know whether the money that uh, is coming from all these uh, big bodies are being chewed up also by the consultants who made the proposal and they're still thinking of, uh, of how they're going to make the sea walls. A five, six year project, the money was granted five, six years ago, but they still cannot decide on what is the design of a seawall. So you can imagine uh, how the mentality of, uh, of this uh, thing works. It's, uh, there's a lot of issues, you know, that come together with this uh, climate change thing. And we have this uh, issue of the loss in population from Tuvalu people they want to migrate because they see no 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 future in Tuvalu. The dilemma is that they know that the country is gonna be underwater one day, and the only way to save Tuvalu right now is no more talk, but just to build it up, adapt by building up Tuvalu by another one or two meters up, and we need that funding to build Tuvalu up in order to save Tuvalu. And I think if we save Tuvalu, we will save Bangladesh, we will save a lot of countries, we will save the world. Thank you. Um, Honorable Teo, thank you very much for that very powerful picture that you painted of how people in Tuvalu are living the realities of the impacts of what um, we have done with putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere over the last 150 years. The, of the slides that you showed, there's one that I made a particular note of, and that was a little girl with her feet in the sand holding a sign saying, I don't want to leave my Tuvalu. And um, I think that picture will stay with me for some time. And it is so sad that the people least 
responsible for climate change are paying the highest price. The other thing I, I, I wonder whether we might be able to pick up later in the discussion is the um, fact that you, you, what was really very important to me was that the people in Tuvalu know what they want to see happen to help them adapt and to reduce the damage that is being done to their island and yet their voices are not being listened to. And I think that's an important takeaway also from the speech that you gave and thank you again for that. Um, we're going to move on to our final speaker uh, now and I apologize in advance for the pronunciation of your name. It is um, Mami, Mami Nin Eina Solendrabe Rabininera. I have completely messed that up, but um, I'm not going to try again because it'll only get worse. And I hope I can refer to you as Mami later. And um, he, Mami is a member of the uh, Parliament of Madagascar. He's been a member of the Parliamentarians Network of the World Bank and IMF since 2015, along with the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption. He is also a member of the African Parliamentarians Network for SDGs. Uh, we've all been hearing a lot about Madagascar, and it is such a tragedy because um, there is no conflict in Madagascar, and the dreadful famine and other impacts of climate change that we're seeing are down to uh, man-made factors. So without further ado, please will you give a very warm welcome to Mami. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, honorable assistance. Je voudrais, je voudrais vous dire d'emblée tout le plaisir que nous, les membres de la délégation parlementaire de Madagascar, éprouvons en nous retrouvant aujourd'hui parmi vous, chers collègues et amis venant des divers parlements du monde. À l'occasion de cette réunion parlementaire, en marge de la COP26 ici à Glasgow, afin de discuter sur le thème « pertes et préjudices », car ce changement climatique, avec ses effets disruptifs, dont aucun pays au monde n'est épargné, nous montre une fois de plus l'importance de l'entraide et de la solidarité entre nous, parlementaires. Madagascar fait partie des pays les moins avancés, malheureusement, dont plus de 75% de la population vit en dessous du seuil de la pauvreté qui est de 1,90$ par jour. Le bilan national de gaz à effet de serre décrit pour le moment notre pays comme un puits, pour le moment. Mais au rythme actuel, nous risquons de perdre ce statut en 2030 pour devenir un émetteur. Madagascar est ainsi un pays fortement exposé et vulnérable au changement climatique. En effet, des impacts des changements climatiques sont ressentis à Madagascar, aussi bien sur l'écosystème que sur les moyens d'existence même. Sur l'écosystème, notamment le cas de déforestation qui affiche malheureusement une moyenne nationale de 2,4% par an. D'après les études, les causes principales ou plutôt les motivations se basent sur le fait que, primo, les forêts sont considérées comme une réserve de terres agricoles et de pâturages. Secondo, il y a également la conversion des forêts en terres de culture sur brûlis. Et tertio, surtout la demande en charbon de bois. En deuxième lieu, mais surtout considéré comme une conséquence de cette déforestation, 
Il y a la disparition des espèces faunistiques due à la perte de la couverture forestière. Et même constat sur l'écosystème côtier, une perte significative de l'habitat marin, la dégradation des côtes en général, l'acidification de la mer, etc., etc. En termes de température, une augmentation moyenne de 2,5 à 3 degrés, degrés Celsius d'ici 2100 est prévisible. Et en dernier lieu, l'intensité et l'agressivité des catastrophes naturelles telles que les cyclones sont à craindre. Sur les moyens d'existence, le système productif traditionnel malagasy, qui est principalement basé sur l'agriculture, L'agriculture, la pêche et l'élevage dépendent surtout des conditions météorologiques. Or, l'imprévisibilité et l'irrégularité des pré précipitations ont d'importantes conséquences sur les productions et perturbent surtout le calendrier cultural. Le déficit de pluie incite alors les paysans à accroître la surface cultivée en défrichant de nouvelles parcelles ou l'itinérance, voire même l'abandon de certaines cultures exigeantes en eau. Ces derniers temps, on parle beaucoup de la menace sur la sécurité alimentaire. La famine dans le sud du pays, qui a fait beaucoup d'écho, est une illustration des conséquences du réchauffement climatique à Madagascar. L'insécurité alimentaire dans cette partie de la grande île atteint le niveau 5 de catastrophe humanitaire. Plus d'un million de personnes se trouvent ainsi en situation d'insécurité alimentaire grave, dans des cas vraiment catastrophiques. Généralement, les causes principales de cette famine sont le déficit pluviométrique qui baisse jusqu'en dessous de 400 mm d'eau par an, entraînant le déficit de production alimentaire, le manque ou carrément l'absence d'aménagement hydroagricole hydro dans certaines régions. Il y a aussi l'enclavement le, dû à la dégradation du réseau routier, mais surtout l'insécurité proprement dite causée par le phénomène du Dahalo. Si tels sont globalement les pertes et préjudices causés par le changement climatique dans notre pays, nous profitons de cette rencontre pour exprimer notre souhait quant à la mise en place de la justice climatique au niveau mondial, l'instauration des droits et obligations de chacun suivant le principe de responsabilité commune mais différenciée. À Madagascar, à l'instar des autres pays, nous souhaiterions également qu'on investisse dans des infrastructures plus résilientes et des pratiques plus durables, comme la mise en place des techniques ag agricoles améliorées, la diversification des cultures, l'intégration de la dimension changement climatique dans les politiques et stratégies nationales et régionales surtout, la mise en place des cadres juridiques adaptés au contexte, la promotion des recherches de développement et de transfert de technologies, ainsi que l'amplification de l'information, de l'éducation et de la sensibilisation. Des efforts dans le domaine du reboisement de l'augmentation des aires protégées, de l'utilisation des énergies renouvelables et de réduction de l'émission de gaz à effet de serre sont également incontournables. Mesdames et messieurs, honorable assistance, pour terminer mon propos, permettez-moi de vous réitérer que la lutte contre le changement climatique doit être un vecteur pour nous unir et nous entraîner vers la coopération et d'agir de concert et de façon plus harmonieuse. Selon un proverbe malagasy que je vais traduire de façon 
euh, libre, la pierre fait bloc, le sable s'éparpille, la solidarité est la clé de la réussite, la division mène vers l'échec. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Mami, thank you. Could you just switch your microphone? Thank you, then that'll stop the feed back. Maybe not. Um, so it was very interesting to me to hear about the um, factors that are driving Madagascar to become a net That will help. Right, sorry, now, now it'll be easier for me to concentrate as well as what, what, I'm, what I'm saying. It was really, to me, um, quite uh, uh, an eye-opener, really, to, to have detailed the factors that are driving Madagascar to become a net emitter of uh, greenhouse gases. And that is, uh, um, I think, something that um, I hadn't appreciated um, fully before. Um, the deforestation that's leading to the loss of uh, biodiversity on land and sea will, will I'm sure, also impact the, the tourism industry, which is re a really important part of Madagascar's um, economy. Um, we're going to move on now to take some statements uh, from some of the delegates who have indicated that they would like to say a few words. Um, I'm going to start, I will take them um, two at a time. I'm going to start with Kazakhstan and Zulfia Sulemanova. And uh, secondly, to hear from Madagascar, Jean-Andre Andre Manjari. So Kazakhstan first, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, dear colleagues, distinguished presenters. At COP, we talk about limiting the growth of global temperature well below 2 degrees and preferably 1.5 degrees. I come from the country which has already experienced the growth in temperature by 2 degrees in the last 100 years. Um, to see the impact of climate change for myself in my country, last year I climbed our glaciers in the Tanshan Mountains to see that in the last, um, since 1950s, they have retreated by over one kilometer and lost 1.3 um, of, of their volume. Um, for us, these are the strategic stocks of our drinking water. This year, I traveled to one's fourth largest inland lake, the Aral Sea, to see that there is no sea anymore. The lands are turning into deserts. The water is extremely scarce. Um, this year, this year we also have experienced a massive drought because of the climate change and it is hitting the most vulnerable population the most. Um, it is also hitting, it, it is also negatively impacting the food security. So uh, we're not sure how we are going to get, come out of this winter because it is going to be very dry, very harsh, very severe. So we're not sure how much water we're going to have next year for food for food production, for drinking, for agriculture, and to support our ecosystems. This morning, one of the presenters noted that the GDP does not reflect the social and environmental costs of pursuit of infinite economic growth. Indeed, the GDP externalizes the health cost of unsustainable production, the fragile livelihoods, and the cost of degraded ecosystems. So sometimes our growth in GDP does not necessarily reflect the gains in quality of life. So we in Kazakhstan were thinking about how can we make sure that our economy is prepared to deal with the negative effects of climate change, that we are resilient to uh, cha rapidly changing environment, that we are able to bounce back should um, disasters hit. Uh, recently, we have adopted a new environmental code uh, in which we have introduced two different chapters. 
that deal with climate change specifically. One is on climate change mitigation and one on climate change adaptation. This was the first time when we actually had climate change adaptation in our legislation. So speaking of adaptation, we actually embedded a separate chapter to make sure that it is the government at all levels, both central and the local levels, that they have this um, responsibility to make sure that they are introducing climate change adaptation actions in everything that they are doing, in their planning processes, that they actually take concrete steps in assessing the vulnerabilities of their respective um, provinces or the sectors to climate change that they develop respective actions to reduce those vulnerabilities and increase the resilience and that they actually take respective actions to protect the most vulnerable population. Uh, we are still have to see how this legislation is going to work. Definitely, we, we are, um, uh, we are ver working very closely with uh, international community with the international organizations to support the, especially the local governments to make to uh, to do the vulnerability assessment but i think the climate change adaptation making sure that we actually internalize the loss and damage that is coming from climate change it is extremely important because we should not be speaking only about the gdp growth but we have to really speak about how are we changing the how are we making sure that the quality of life of the population is ensured and we are talking about the development. Um, and I think, and I would like to thank all my um, co uh, fellow parliamentarians, colleagues, I would like to thank presenters for a very interesting um, session today. It was very interesting, it was very important, it was really great to hear from other states which have a bit different vulnerabilities in terms of climate change, but I just really wanted to share um, our vulnerabilities as one of the biggest, maybe the biggest landlocked developing country in the world which has so many vulnerabilities to climate change and which it, um, and who is not always uh, represented enough at the global stage. Thank you very much. Um, Zulfia Sulemanova, thank you very much for that very thoughtful contribution. Um, before I ask, uh, before I move on to Jean-André fr uh, from uh, Madagascar, I'm going to turn to our panelists here to ask for their comments um, on not just on the, some of the um, actions that Kazakhstan is taking and um, their relevance to loss and damage, um, but, but um, also whether you think there is anything else that could be doing and how we could maybe turn the focus more on to local voices and local actions. Um, Valerie, Professor, would you like to go first? Um, thank you very much. Um, th thank you for uh, the, the human uh, view on what are the implications of a changing climate for different places on Earth. Um, I would like to flag that um, more information will come from forthcoming IPCC reports scheduled in February and March and currently under or coming soon for government review. Um, the report on risks, impacts, vulnerability and adaptation, which is now scheduled for next February. And the one scheduled for March on options to reduce emissions, what we call mitigation. And just coming from the climate research field myself, I would like to flag how much accurate climate information at the regional scale is also part of solutions. Uh, when uh, the needs from users, when the local experience from practitioners is combined with the expertise on the use of climate data sets, this is something that is also critical, not just to look backwards at events that have already occurred and have caused damages, but also to combine that information to look forward uh, and include the characteristics that will change in the future so as to include them in um, risk reduction um, and in adaptation planning. So I wanted to flag this aspect uh, and also the fact that, for instance, in our last report, uh, we show how much different trajectories of greenhouse gas emissions will affect, for instance, the timing of when we reach half a, half a meter, one meter, two meters of future sea level rise, so as to also understand 
the consequences of action that can be taken now, not just now, but also in the coming decades, centuries, uh, for countries where this is really strategic in terms of potential loss of land. So this, it's a novel aspect, not just looking at you know, degrees of warming, but levels of sea level rise that matter for coastal uh, areas and coastal communities. Thank you. Um, thank you, Valerie. Uh, Sabo Chowdhury, would you like to yes. respond? Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Kazakhstan for that intervention. I, I noted three points. First was a very important point about GDP and to what extent does that give a true and accurate picture. Um, I can share with you what we are looking at in Bangladesh, uh, is to have satellite accounts for uh, nature and uh, na natural capital. I think that's very important. You know, so um, you may not have it in your GDP, but you can have a satellite account for it uh, UNEP is promoting it. There are many organizations who are doing it. I think that's always very useful because remember what you cannot measure, you do not value. So it is absolutely fundamental that, um, you know, this an exercise along similar lines is done, especially now because nature-based solutions are actually becoming more and more important. Um, so how do you work with nature? How do you, uh, how can you be in harmony and in sync with nature? rather than waging a war against nature. You know, I think that's one of the mind shifts that we need to look at. Uh, you talked about adaptation, yes, but adaptation has its limits. You know, adaptation will only go so far. So at the end of the day, remember, uh, mitigation is really your best form of adaptation. Because if temperature rises are going to be four or five degrees, uh, you simply will fail to adapt just as with uh, displacement, and then we talked about loss and damage. Loss and damage comes in when both adaptation and mitigation have failed. So by all means, you know, prepare for adaptation, but that's not really the solution. And the way I would explain it is, you have to look at the disease rather than the symptoms of the disease. So get to the, get to the main point, and that has to be mitigation. That's absolutely fundamental. Uh, you talked about vulnerability. You know, in Bangladesh, we also have various studies uh, giving us the vulnerability index. But I think what we have to increasingly look at is a risk profile of the country. There is a difference between vulnerability and risk. You know, vulnerability is basically inherent weakness in your infrastructure, your setup, your design. Uh, risk is the potential for loss. And this is where disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation comes in. You know, we have to look at a convergence between the two. So this is what we are trying to do in Bangladesh. Maybe, you know, other countries can also look at it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I think uh, nature-based -based solutions are something that we are going to have to concentrate on. Um, what we have to stop doing is, and, and, and and something that you're doing in, in Bangladesh is um, the, the, the adding to the greenhouse gases through methane. I mean, that is something that is um, going to make a big impact, isn't it, in, in the near future, rather than um, uh, the fossil fuels that we are burning that put carbon dioxide, which will last for many, many, many more years. So I think nature-based solution is something that if we if the world was put our mind to, that we can impact and um, start to um, uh, get a result from sooner rather than later. Um, so, Honourable Teo, would you like to um, address, no, you're okay, and um, Mami from, Mami, would you like to say anything on the contribution from Kazakhstan? No. Okay, excellent. So we're going to move on now to Jean-André and Nedimanjari from Madagascar. Jean-André, the floor is yours. Madame le Présidente, merci de... Bon, je peux commencer? Merci de me voir donner la parole. Ben, je me présente. Uh, Jemanzari Jandré, doyen du Sénat de Madagascar, après avoir été successivement député 
ministre et aujourd'hui sénateur. Vous savez, nous sommes présents parmi vous aujourd'hui après un vol de 14 heures, parce que le vol d'Antananarive jusqu'ici à Glasgow, ça dure 14 heures. Et nous sommes par, parmi vous pour euh, participer à cette réunion de parlementaire en marge de la réunion de COP26. Mes deux collègues de l'Assemblée nationale ont si bien présenté leurs interventions que je ne vais pas être en ce qui concerne la mienne. Le gouvernement de mon pays fait beaucoup d'efforts pour protéger l'environnement. La preuve, c'est que on a deux ministères, à savoir le ministère de l'Environnement et le, le secrétariat d'État allé à la réforestation. Les lois existent. Bien sûr, mais pour leur application, il y a encore des problèmes qui se posent. Nous, de notre côté, en tant que parlementaire, qu'est-ce que nous pouvons faire Je me rappelle de la phrase d'un auteur français qui s'appelle André Gide. Il, est dit, il a dit ceci, « Le monde ne peut changer que par des insoumis. » Entre guillemets, bien sûr, parce qu'il s'agit d'une citation. Est-ce que les parlements ont les moyens de faire pression sur les membres du gouvernement pour que eux, à leur tour, ils commencent à, être, à prendre conscience de la situation et carrément euh, apporter leur contribution pour, que, pour lutter contre le changement climatique. Si, dans mon pays, l'article 102 de notre Constitution dit bien que le Sénat peut s'adresser au, au gouvernement par une question écrite, une question orale, par une euh, interpellation ou une euh, enquête parlementaire. Donc tout ça, ça constitue des moyens importants pour faire plier le gouvernement. Et puis, Personnellement, article 80, 83 de la même Constitution, en tant que sénateur, nous sommes habilités à conseiller le président, non, le, 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 le gouvernement, dans la prise des décisions qui sont importantes pour le pays. Donc, voilà des outils entre nos mains donc, pour agir. Moi, je pense ici que les riches, ils auront toujours des solutions. Peut-être qu'ils vont vivre dans des serres climatisées. Peut-être qu'ils iront, ils iront sur Mars vivre là-bas. Et nous, les pays en développement pauvre, on reste sur place. Donc, c'est plutôt nous qui serons alors les victimes de ce changement climatique. Moi, je suis un croyant. Je me réfère de temps en temps à la Bible. Sodome et Gomorre. Donc il y aura un Sodome et Gomorre bis, je ne sais pas quand, mais ça risque d'arriver. Mais quand Sodome et Gomorre, première édition, s'est produite, c'était Dieu qui était, qui était en colère contre le, 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 la race humaine. Cette fois-ci, c'est nous-mêmes qui allons détruire notre planète. Donc, n'allez pas dire que c'est Dieu, mais c'est nous-mêmes. Avec ce que nous sommes en train de faire, là, notre planète Terre risque de disparaître, je ne sais pas quand. Mais moi, 
Je pense à mes petits-enfants, à mes arrière-petits-enfants. Et là, vraiment, c'est donc, euh, je ne sais pas comment qualifier ça, mais à cause de ce que nous, nous avons fait, nous, la génération qui était avant, nos enfants ne risquent plus de connaître la vie sur terre. Et c'est vraiment dommage. Je vous remercie de m'avoir écouté. Um, thank you very much, Andre, for that uh, contribution. Um, I wonder whether, we, before we move on, whether any of the panel would like to come back on the, is, the, the issue that um, was raised there uh, about laws being in place but implementation uh, being an issue. Does anyone like to have any comments on that? Shall we move on? Thank you. Um, I think this is a challenge across the board, you know, and um, the way that I would look at it is, you know, we are referred to as lawmakers, but we also have to ensure that the laws are actually implemented. It's not just making of the laws. It's within our, our remit, it's within our responsibility to make sure that the laws that we enact are actually implemented. So, in a way, if we say that they are not being implemented, I think we also have to take part of that responsibility because we need to do that. That's, that's also part of our job, not just making the law, but also implementing it. And if I may just make one, one point, you know, I think, um, I know notes are being, are being taken. Um, one of the very serious issues I think that we no, need to look at is the UNFCCC treaty and the way um, we are progressing matters. You see, UNFCCC treaty works on the basis of consensus, which means out of 195 countries, even if only one country objects to something, that is going to slow the entire process down. So what you actually do is to move forward, you go on the basis of the lowest, lowest common denominator. When you're trying to be bold, when you're trying to be aspirational, when you're trying to be decisive, that is not a recipe for success because nothing gets agreed till everyone agrees. Nothing gets agreed till everything is agreed. So in UNFCCC, we are looking at mitigation, we are looking at finance, we are looking at adaptation, loss and damage. So lack of progress in one area is going to hold up progress everywhere else. And this is a personal view, I think as parliamentarians, perhaps even the IPU, uh, because this is also part of our oversight responsibilities. We have to look at reform of UNFCCC the way the process is moving forward. We are in an emergency. We need to move uh, as a gazelle sprints, but we are moving at the pace of maybe the koala bear in Africa. So I think that's something that we really need to think about as parliamentarians, and that's where we can make a difference as change agents. Thank you. Thank you. And Valerie, I think you wanted to add something to that. Um, Yes, uh, uh, I would like to stress that uh, ahead of COP26, there has also been a declaration from um, the international senior scientific advisors stressing the importance of uh, scientific evidence-based strategies. And what we also note is a, a growing implementation of scientific bodies to advise governments, uh, providing independent, robust evidence that can be used also to assess the efficacy of, uh, of law projects and monitor progress that is achieved in a rigorous and transparent way. So I wanted to also flag uh, this uh, growing uh, dimension of uh, evidence-based information to support uh, governance. Valerie, thank you very much. It's good to know that uh, science is bearing fruit. Um, I'm going to move on to Croatia now and ask Marko Pavic to speak, followed by Ukraine, Alona Shukram. So, uh, Marko Pavic first. Thank you very much, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. Uh, global warming is a global problem and we need global solution. That's why I'm cautiously optimistic for this COP, especially with all the major contributors had given zero, car net, zero net carbon pledge uh, for, for them. European Union wants to be the leader 
in this process, and we have 1,800 billion euro stimulus package. Most of it will go to the Green Plan. I'm also former minister of the uh, EU funds in Croatia, and I'm especially proud that our Prime Minister also supported it at COP and announced that we will have 45 reduction of greenhouse emissions by 2030 and we will stop using coal by 2033. I was also very proud when he announced that Croatia will protect almost a third of our seas as I'm climate scientist and oceanographer and I've been privileged and had offered to visit Antarctica with, with the British Antarctic Survey looking into the Antarctic cyclical polar current and I also worked with rapid array and carbon transports in North Atlantic. Yesterday I was in Edinburgh at the fantastic uh, side event of I Atlantic project where all the scientists from both Europe, North America, South America and Africa gathered together and they reminded us that 90% of excess heat and 25% of anthropogenic CO2 is accepted by the oceans. One question that I would like to raise is abrupt changes and point of no returns. We see we have the progress, but for instance, especially in North Atlantic with the possible freshwater inputs and slowing down uh, overturning circulation, we could have lots of side effects and feedbacks that will be abrupt and will, will cross the points of no return. So one of the questions is also, how can we deal with that, and especially if the response is not quick enough, as we see that some of the countries will become carbon neutral by 2060 or 70. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And could I ask Alona Shukram from Ukraine for her contribution? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Well, thank you for such important discussions and very useful, very emotional sometimes interventions. Believe me, Ukraine does take the climate issue very serious. I can tell you truthfully that for the past two years, we have faced um, the, the record of climate change related disasters more than we've ever seen during our history. For example, we have seen in the year of 2020, 72 times more fires burning in Ukraine from May till October that we've ever seen before. 80% uh, of our crops in some of the regions were burnt and were lost. In some of the regions, 100% of the crops were lost. And what is even worse, the fires started to burn in the forest near Chernobyl, uh, which actually raised the level of radiation for the capital of Ukraine and even for the countries uh, which are neighboring countries such as Belarus and Poland. So we do take this issue very seriously and we see the effect of the climate-related disasters and climate change in Ukraine already. Um, my colleague has spoken about the undertakings we have done here in Glasgow. Ukraine was also the third country in the world that ratified the Paris Agreement. I was the member of the parliament then and I'm proud of that. But there is another thing that worries me a lot, because we are not only talking about important um, willingness of the countries to deal with it, we are not only talking about the undertakings we do, but it is also about the trust, about cooperation, about the respect of the agreement that we sign and respect of international law in general. For example, in my country, 7% of our territory is under occupation. We do not have access to access the climate-related disasters or changes in the eastern part of Ukraine because it is occupied by Russian Federation. We do not have access to Crimea, which is annexed by Russia. Uh, it directly relates to climate change agreements here because, for example, Russia submits emission numbers for Crimea, and so do we. And obviously it doesn't work and it shouldn't work like that. We will not be able to accept any UN document, for example, which will refer to the numbers that Russia submits to the next Crimea. And this will go on and on. We are obviously not the only country in this situation. So the level of trust and the agreements we sign will depend on the level of the implementation and respect of international law. So that's why I wanted to raise this issue during the process of assessment of loss and damages. We will have to start to deal with the international law violations. And I would really ask you to come back to your governments and to talk about this issue, to not accept the violations of international law in the climate-related fields as well. Thank you so much for those discussions.
Um, thank you. I know that uh, uh, Valerie, uh, Professor um, Masson Demot, is very keen to come back on the comments from uh, Marco Pavic from Croatia. Over to you, Valerie. Thank you. Um, there were uh, remarks related to nature based solutions, and I would like to say one thing on that. So, today we emit around 40 billion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere every year and 31% uh, goes into the land, about 23% is stored by the ocean. So they limit the scale of warming. And I wanted to flag that we see ocean processes that are starting to change. And these processes will probably in the future, with warming above two degrees by 2050 or more, they would limit the relative efficacy of the ocean sink. And we also expect a, a reduced efficacy of the land sink with large warming, especially because of the effect of heat stress, water stress, or fire on plant growth. So I wanted to flag these aspects in how we interact with ecosystems and their services. Now regarding the point about um, what we call uh, low likelihood, but potentially high impact eventualities, uh, we have assessed the state of knowledge in our report. What are these possibilities? large forest dieback due to thresholds related to water availability in a given region, high warming if uh, the future response of the climate system is above our best estimate. Um, another aspect is uh, the triggering of instabilities in several sectors of Antarctica. So in our report for the first time, we report what would be the maximum outcome if it is triggered in a high warming scenario how much more sea level rise would be expected from processes currently poorly understood, uh, also because we don't have enough observations uh, in these uh, sensitive areas uh, at the interface between the Southern Ocean and the Antarctic ice sheet. And your point was about the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. At the moment, we have a, a, a not a full understanding of the changes taking place. The observation network you mentioned uh, is only available for 20 years. We have indirect evidence that is uh, contrasted. For the future, we have medium confidence for a, a decline in this circulation during this century, um, and uh, uh, medium confidence that it will not involve an abrupt collapse uh, during this century. But we cannot rule it out. So what we provide in our report is our knowledge if this happens. For instance, if there's an unexpected melt meltwater flow from the Gr Greenland Antarctic ice sheet, and we describe what would be the consequences, for instance, abrupt shifts in weather patterns, especially for tropical precipitation patterns and monsoons. So this is an example where our state of knowledge remains limited, but we provide knowledge that is asked to us, but those, for instance, managing critical infrastructure and would like to know what is the full range of possible outcomes so as to prepare, especially for critical coastal infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie. Um, I've got four people who would like to contribute from the floor, so, uh, and I would like to make sure that we, we do have time to hear all of them. Time is tight, so I would welcome um, each of the four people keep their remarks as short as possible, and we will take them one after the other. The first will be Pakistan, Mushahid Hussein, followed by Belgium, Melissa Hanus, followed by Poland, um, Agnieszka Pomaska, and then Argentina's Eugenia Dure. So first um, speaker will be Mushahid Hussein. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, greetings from Pakistan, which as you know is uh, among the most vulnerable countries as far as climate change is concerned. We are considered the seventh most vulnerable country. And Pakistan, I just want to make two uh, short comments and one proposal. Pakistan uh, is, has a unique topography, mountains, deserts, beaches, valleys, rivers. And we have had over 150 freak weather in incidents in the last couple of decades. And 10 years ago, my country, 20% of my country was under water. And we even had an avalanche. Uh, 3,000 meters, 4,000 meters above sea level in the Siachen Glacier. So melting glaciers, freak uh, weather incidents, forest fires, uh, uh, 
uh, other kinds of ins uh, flash floods, we are victim to that. So we are taking a lot of initiatives which are quite unique. And uh, as chairman of the Defense Committee in the Parliament of Pakistan, I've always focused on the fact, and we are now redefining the concept of national security. It's no more defined only in terms of military might. It has to include a key elements of human security. We're talking of health, pandemics, population, education, and above all, climate change and environment. And I launched the first initiative in the Pakistan parliament seven years ago for uh, a briefing and education on climate change and environment. So what do we do globally on that in front? Because this is an issue which is a borderless issue, a global issue. My proposal would be that there are at the moment three major global initiatives for connectivity. There is China's Belt and Road Initiative, and we welcome what President Xi Jinping said about uh, ending support, uh, financial support to coal-fired plants, and I think that's a very good initiative because uh, uh, it will help uh, uh, mitigating the consequences of climate change. There are two other similar initiatives. One is from the West, uh, from President Biden, which is B3W, Build Back Better World, and the other one is from the European Union, a global gateway. I would suggest that when we talk of these regional initiatives, there should be a certain allocation for projects that they are funding in the most vulnerable countries from the overall project costs. And that, I think, would play a very big role. And all these three initiatives can have a collective approach in supporting uh, such mitigation of climate change. And this would help countries, not just Pakistan, we have heard low-lying countries, we have heard other countries also. So it would be a major initiative. So this is a global crisis which requires a collective response. And I think it should be about any partisan politics. Thank you very much. And we bring special greetings from Pakistan. And we welcome you all. We are taking some major initiatives next year also. And we Excellent. hope that we can cooperate closely with IPU and the uh, uh, international community. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. And could I ask Melissa Hannes from Belgium for her remarks? Merci à toutes et tous, et merci plus particulièrement aux interventions qui ont été exprimées par les parlementaires dans le cadre de ce débat. Moi, je tenais à prendre la parole déjà pour exprimer justement ma solidarité face aux, même aux images qui nous ont été montrées des conséquences du dérèglement climatique à travers le monde. Dans mon cas, moi je suis la plus jeune députée de Belgique et je faisais partie, et je fais encore partie maintenant, de toute cette génération Youth for Climate à travers le monde. C'est mon premier mandat de député, donc j'ai été élue pour la première fois en 2019. Et c'est vrai qu'en arrivant au Parlement belge, j'avais de grands espoirs, j'ai de grands espoirs que des actions concrètes puissent être mises en place dans le cadre de ce type d'événement qu'est la COP26 à Glasgow. Et je pense que tous les citoyens qui nous regardent, qui sont attentifs à cette COP, attendent des réponses concrètes et des actes. Et donc, dans le cadre de cette discussion, moi, ce que je voulais échanger avec vous de la réalité belge, c'est que je pense que cette conscientisation des conséquences du dérèglement climatique, elle s'est faite à travers les années, bien entendu, mais elle a peut-être pris une ampleur exacerbé cette année, en 2021, lorsque nous, nous avons vu sur notre sol belge un événement important en termes de conditions extrêmes au niveau météorologique qui ont créé des inondations importantes dans des zones de notre pays. Et cet exemple qui s'est abattu cet été, en juillet 2021, nous a démontré, je pense qu'il peut faire aussi un petit peu la synthèse, en tout cas qui est en toile de fond de ce débat, c'est que les conséquences du réchauffement climatique, elles s'abattent d'autant plus fort sur les publics les plus vulnérables. Et même en Belgique, lorsque ces inondations ont eu lieu, on a vu qu'elles ont eu des conséquences plus importantes auprès des personnes les plus vulnérables. Et donc, à cet égard, une des orientations qui sont prises par nos gouvernements, ce n'est pas la réponse unique, mais c'est une des orientations, c'est d'investir au niveau national, dans la recherche scientifique pour permettre
permettre justement de voir et d'anticiper le plus possible les conséquences du dérèglement climatique sur notre territoire. Et dès lors, peut-être la question qui est posée, c'est en termes de recherche scientifique sur l'évolution des conséquences du climat, quelles sont, quelles sont les actions qui sont mises en place, que pouvons-nous soutenir, nous, dans le cadre de cette COP à cet égard et plus spécifiquement sur la recherche scientifique. Merci pour m'avoir laissé la parole et encore bravo à tous. Thank you. And can we now move on to Agnieszka Pomaska from Poland. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank uh, those representatives from Bangladesh, Tuvalu and Madagascar for their touching speeches and interventions. Because we know that influence of the climate change is different in different, part, in different parts of the world and it's crucial because it's linked to the education. We, don't, we haven't spoken too much about education, but I think it's very, very important. I mean, climate change education. And in many countries, including my country, including Poland, it should be improved because if the knowledge about climate change consequences is low, that means that the pressure on the governments is also low. So we need higher pressure on the governments, and it can be done also by educating people that there are countries like Bangladesh, Tuvalu, and Madagascar, which suffer at the moment. We don't talk about next 10, 20 years. We have to talk what's happening now. In Poland, in Belgium, uh, the climate change consequences are not that obvious, are not that visible. So we have to tell all these stories in our countries. And I, all, I call all participants of this meeting to share these stories in your countries. And it's also my promise. I come from the city of Gdańsk, the city of the solidarity, solidarity movement, and I have solidarity in my heart. And that's my promise that I will share all these stories as often as possible, including today on my social media. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's, that's good of you. Um, could I ask for the final contribution from Eugenia Dur from uh, Argentina? And please, can you keep it brief because I am up against the clock here. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Quiero agradecer a los parlamentarios y a las parlamentarias que han llegado de diferentes partes del mundo. Yo vengo desde el lugar más austral de la Tierra. Vengo de Tierra del Fuego, Antártida e Islas del Atlántico Sur, a más de 15.500 kilómetros de Glasgow. Y vengo en representación del Parlamento Argentino, junto a mis compañeras diputadas y senadoras. Vengo a poner la palabra de Argentina, porque es nuestro país que ha liderado aquí en la COP un reclamo en conjunto con otros países que tiene que ver con algo que también se ha manifestado aquí, que es la posibilidad de que la deuda financiera externa que ahoga y además impide a nuestros países en desarrollo que se salve con acciones climáticas. Pero también decir que es nuestro país, la Argentina, hace un tiempo a esta parte que ha tomado la cuestión ambiental como una política de Estado y es eso lo que ha venido también a profundizar y a ratificar aquí a la COP26. Decía que nuestros países que lidera este pedido Argentina aquí en la COP necesitamos que el canje de deuda externa sea por acción climática, trasladarle esta consideración y esta propuesta argentina a la consideración de ustedes a forma de pregunta como también nos solicitaron y trasladarle también la pregunta de qué piensan ustedes como parlamentarios y parlamentarias y representantes del mundo aquí de la creación de un fondo de resiliente de deuda a los países más vulnerables de nuestro planeta. Decir también como segunda consideración que quiero poner sobre esta mesa algo que no se ha mencionado, que tiene que ver con eh, la perspectiva de género ambiental. Se ha hablado de los niños, de las niñas, pero nosotros bien sabemos que los problemas ambientales profundizan sobre todo las vulnerabilidades sociales, de género,
de niños, de niñas, de nuestros pueblos originarios. Y es por eso que siempre se profundizan en los pueblos menos desarrollados como es la Argentina. Decir algunos datos antes de la pregunta y con esto finalizar. Decir que las mujeres seguimos siendo minoría y lo podemos ver aquí hoy entre quienes deciden las estrategias ambientales y energéticas mundiales. Decir también que somos además las mujeres quienes tenemos 14 veces más probabilidades de ser víctimas de un desastre natural y también representamos junto a los niños, las juventudes y las diversidades las personas por debajo, el 70% de las personas por debajo de la línea de la pobreza. En el Parlamento Argentino nosotros hemos aprobado diferentes leyes para decir la ley del manejo del fuego, la ley Yolanta, la ley de educación ambiental, la ratificación del acuerdo de Escazú, la ley de etiquetado frontal y diferentes foros legislativos que se trabajan con la comunidad, en este caso en el Parlamento Argentino. Preguntarles a ustedes, en este caso, la segunda pregunta de mi parte, de qué manera consideran que desde aquí, como parlamentarios mundiales, podemos contribuir a cortar estas brechas de género, sobre todo con mujeres, niños, juventudes y sobre todo de manera social en materia ambiental y luego de la COVID-19. Muchas gracias. Thank you to all four of the last speakers for your contributions. I think that we are hearing a theme here that uh, trust has been uh, something that's lacking, but we need to build in this COP26 if this COP26 is to be a success. Um, I, I don't know whether the panels have... We are out of time, actually, and I'm getting looks from... Uh, um, the organizers here, but if there's anything that the um, panelists would like to add in, in 10, 20 seconds, please do. Okay, uh, and Mr. Chavi, would you like to also? But very quickly now. Um, the importance of education and climate literacy has been flagged, and last week I was at a meeting with students and early career scientists, and they asked me to ask you one question. The question is the following. We've worked with 233 authors from 65 countries to deliver the best state of knowledge. Uh, we have provided a summary for policymakers. Have you read our summary for policymakers? This is the question they wanted me to ask you. Can you raise your hand if you have read it? Thank you so much on behalf of the scientists who have worked on that. And Mr. Chowdhury. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Just uh, one uh, parting thought. Let us not underestimate our ability to make a difference. You know, as parliamentarians, we can make a difference. We should make a difference. We are not the mouthpieces of government. We are there to perform oversight. So it is very important we retain our independence. I'm very encouraged. There are so many initiatives. Uh, there is an initiative to uh, criminalize uh, ecocide, you know, recognize ecocide and criminalize it internationally as well as domestic legislation. Parliamentarians are getting together for a, a fossil fuel uh, free future. That is also very encouraging. You know, we have the uh, Climate Vulnerable Forum organizing uh, a group of parliamentarians from 48 countries. So this activism, I think it's going to be very important. Let us try and take initiatives of our own and try to bring about change rather than waiting for the governments to act. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And I'm just going to say one, uh, uh, just a few closing remarks from myself. Um, I think there is room for optimism. I know we have heard some uh, very um, sad details of how some of the most vulnerable countries have been affected, but I cast my mind back to several decades ago um, my my um, academic background is as a scientist, as a chemist, but I left it to go into advertising. And in the late 1980s, I had enough and I needed to go back into um, evidence base to see what was happening with, with the climate. And there was real concern at that time uh, because the ozone layer, uh, the ozone hole had been discovered and acid rain was a big issue. And these were things that were visible and they really shocked the world into action and they were tackled. 
If we could do it in the 80s, now when the impact of climate change is becoming so real and we see it every day on our television screens and it is impacting in the northern hemisphere, I really think that we will now see some action. So I hope very much that this COP26 will produce some good results. And really with some of the contributions that we've heard and from the parliamentarians who have contributed and the concern that's been voiced, I know we can make it work if we continue to hold our government's feet to the fire. Can I thank my panelists very much for their contributions and thank all of you as well. Thank you. Thank you. And could I ask everybody on the hall if they will leave their language headsets on their table, please? Um, but I will now hand over to the, the next speakers. Right, well, uh, dear colleagues, um, you have uh, the stamina of people who have flown for hours on end to reach this destination. And we are now in our final and I think most crucial session of the day. And this is the session that stands between us and the drinks reception later. So um, I know that uh, you will want to hear from our two colleagues, as you know, the UK and Italy have been honoured to be co-hosts of this COP26. Some of you will have been uh, to Rome in October and uh, some of you are, are here now and some um, uh, uh, will know already our next panellists, but they're here to, to update you on the important work that they've been doing, uh, particularly in drafting uh, the uh, outcome document that all parliaments have, who are members of the IPU have, uh, have signed up to. And so, first of all, I want to introduce you to one of those uh, co-authors, Ms. Alessia Rotta, who is a member of the Italian Chamber of Deputies and is president of the Standing Committee for the Environment, Territory and Public Works. She's been the Democratic Party member for Verona since 2013, and she served on numerous committees, including the European Union Committee and the Finance Committee. At a young age, Ms. Rota co-founded the Lucignola Association, which works to increase youth participation in environmental and cultural issues in the Verona area. Alessia. Thank you. Thank you, Ariet. I will speak in Italian. So, ringrazio davvero uh, tutti quanti voi, colleghi, presidenti, speaker, amici, per l'intensa partecipazione di lavoro emendativo che abbiamo fatto in questi mesi assieme e che ben rende l'idea della gravità del nostro impegno, della comune percezione della necessità di un'azione climatica concertata da tutti i nostri parlamenti. Ringrazio naturalmente di cuore assieme a tutti voi il mio colorato compagno di viaggio Alex Sobel. Il nostro 
lavoro credo sia stato attraversato da parole che non sono solo parole, ma sentimenti condivisi di urgenza, di ambizione, di solidarietà. Al coraggio delle nostre parole oggi, domani, deve seguire il coraggio e la costanza delle nostre azioni. La nostra epica, come ha detto qualcuno oggi, il nostro, la nostra rivoluzione pacifica non è una strada in discesa. Se il pianeta, come abbiamo sentito ripetere, come sentiamo ripetere tutti i giorni, non ha tempo, noi non avremo una chiamata di appello. Il confronto emerso in questi giorni, cari colleghi, che ha arricchito il documento tra esperienze legislative diverse, appelli e la condivisa convinzione di dover marciare assieme a partire dalle diversità che abbiamo sentito raccontare, o meglio le unicità di ogni singolo Paese, al termine di questo percorso, che in realtà non è un termine ma è solo una tappa, ci ha resi dal mio punto di vista più forti nel sapere che nessuno di noi, ognuno nel nostro Parlamento, nel confronto, nello stimolo, nell'incalzare i nostri governi, nessuno si sentirà solo perché sapremo che ognuno di noi ha dietro di sé tutti noi. E allora la doppia emergenza, quella climatica e quella del Covid-19, ci chiama ad agire senza indugio nella transizione ecologica dei sistemi produttivi, della trasformazione degli stili di vita, dei modelli organizzativi, con tempi e modalità che non sono più negoziabili. Ogni rilassamento, infatti, metterebbe a repentaglio la stessa utilità di quello che stiamo facendo, cioè della transizione energetica ed ecologica. Sottolineo brevemente alcuni punti del documento, come l'adozione di strumenti di analisi di impatto climatico ex ante ed ex post, l'utilizzo di tecnologie. Perché è chiaro, cari colleghi, che gli strumenti tecnologici avanzati di misurazione e trasparenza non possono solo servire a fare delle apocalittiche o meglio realistiche previsioni su quello che accadrà domani o sta già accadendo o essere nella disponibilità di chi ne calcola e quindi chi ne deriva dei profitti. Se noi non li utilizzeremo come strumenti di governo parlamentare saremo condannati dalla storia. Lasciatemi poi sottolineare alcuni piccoli grandi punti del nostro documento, nostro documento, la battaglia climatica è anche e soprattutto una battaglia di genere contro le disuguaglianze, perché è vero, se è vero come è vero, che le donne e le ragazze hanno 14 volte di più la probabilità di essere vittime di un disastro naturale e che le donne e le ragazze costituiscono il 70% delle persone che vivono sotto la soglia di povertà. E allora anche questo è uno dei nostri compiti. Così come abbiamo sottolineato negli ultimi interventi il ruolo decisivo della scienza, messo pure in discussione dopo questo anno e mezzo di pandemia in maniera intollerabile. E allora nelle decisioni di policy making la scienza deve essere il nostro faro, così come nel dibattito pubblico. Infine lasciatemi salutarvi con un'immagine già usata da qualcuno più coronato di me, Voglio parlare delle farfalle che non sono solo simbolo della biodiversità, ma vorrei citare la famosa teoria delle farfalle secondo la quale un battito d'ali di farfalle in un punto del mondo, dall'altro capo del mondo, può provocare un uragano. Questa teoria scientifica, come sapete e come sappiamo, è spesso tradotta nel concetto che piccole azioni possono contribuire a grandi cambiamenti. E allora questa teoria però si riflette su di noi domandandoci se così accade per le ali delle farfalle. L'azione di 179 parlamenti può non generare grandi cambiamenti ed essere meno delle ali delle farfalle. Credo che ognuno di noi senta in maniera molto pesante questa responsabilità sulle proprie spalle. Noi che, a differenza di altri, a differenza dei cittadini, non possiamo abbandonarci alla rabbia non possiamo rassegnarci all'impotenza. Noi non possiamo permettere che il vantaggio di pochi possa danneggiare il pianeta di tutti. 
Perciò da COP26 pretendiamo impegni chiari, vincolanti, irreversibili. Grazie. Grazie Alessia per la tua parola e il lavoro che hai fatto come co-rapporteur per l'IPU. E ora vorrei introdurre il mio collega dal Parlamento UK, Alex Sobel who has been the Labour member for Leeds Northwest since 2017. He travelled uh, by train to Rome, and he is currently a member of the Environmental Audit Select Committee in the UK Parliament, previously on the Backbench Business Committee. And uh, you, uh, Alex, are the co-rapporteur elected by the British group of the IPU to take this role, and perhaps you could share with everyone your perceptions of this draft outcome document. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Harriet. Um, I, I first of all want to thank Alessia for um, working so closely together on this document. We produced initially what we thought was a very strong document, but it was clear that the, the, there were gaps. And then I want to thank all of you and, and members of your parliaments who came forward with amendments which closed the gaps and have strengthened this document. This isn't a document, my document, it's not Alessia's document, this is our collective document, the document of the global parliament. And I think that is the most important thing that I think we can say in this session, that we all jointly own this document. I want to thank the British group of the, of the IPU I want to thank Martin as Secretary General of the IPU and Duarte as the President of the IPU and all the staff that have made this event possible and the process that, we, that has got us to reach this place here in Glasgow at COP on the fringes of the negotiations. Um, we are all parliaments from around the world and we share the same ambitions and we must use our position in our parliaments and here in COP in Glasgow to represent our constituents and ensure that action does happen and we get the strongest possible agreement, strongest possible communique at the end of this COP. Climate change will affect every person on our planet. If we do not act now in response, this code red for humanity will cause destruction, dismay and disaster. Our language every time we meet is ramping up. It cannot ramp up anymore. And one of the frustrations is that our language ramps up but the climate action doesn't ramp up in response. And so we need to push harder and push our governments harder. We're in a desperate race towards net zero emissions. We must win this race to protect our planet, protect humanity and all of the species that live on the planet with us. The words that we hear from the world leaders are honorable, but words alone will do nothing to stop this calamity. We collectively, today, demand the actions of governments of the world are honourable to and meet our ambition. It's not a question of choice. It is a question of whether we want to leave our children with a planet they can prosper and flourish in. It is a question of our survival, of the survival of the planet itself. We as parliamentarians bear significant responsibility. We're in a position that can help the most vulnerable people in the world. Parliaments have the power to enact legislation, adopt budgets, and ensure accountability for the effective implementation of our commitment to reaching net zero emissions. Like many of you, I have been on the marches that have happened in the last couple of days. We've seen hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of Glasgow, around the UK, and across the world. We hear the chants of the young people in Glasgow. It fills me with hope that there is the desire of the next generation to solve this existential problem. But we need to step not just with them on the march, but we need to step with them every part of the journey. And I believe the outcome document does help us. And it is reflected in the document that we are hopefully shortly going to uh, agree. The, the document actually that you've seen has one last addition from the French delegation who I'd like to thank, which is about how we in parliaments need to also work with local and regional government uh, uh, 
and that is, was missing but now is included and I think completes the sort of circle of forces that we need to gather to take on climate change. But it's not a, a process that has started and finished today. It's um, work that all of our parliamentary groups have been doing over the last six months. We debated this document in Rome and we're now ready to adopt it. I just want to make three points about um, the, the document, of, of the content of the document. First of all, that um, it demands that we stop fossil fuel subsidies and ensure that financial decisions in fossil fuels reflect fully the risk of stranded assets. Secondly, that, that governments do what is morally right and make reparations to those nations that suffer because of the profits. We, and we're sitting in a city, a city that was one of the cities that started the Industrial Revolution, not just in the UK, but in the world. This country is the first country to industrialize. And actually, although it's not a very big country in terms of population, it is the eighth biggest emitter historically. So we in the UK Parliament, the UK government, bear a huge responsibility, and none of us are shirking it. Um, but we need to ensure that we make reparations to the countries that are suffering because of the profits we have made by burning those fossil fuels. The floor of 100 billion in climate financing must be met, and as we've heard today in the session, must then be ramped up. You know, we had a, a figure earlier of 700 billion. I'm sure this is a debate for Sharm El Sheikh is to see where we go from 100, 100 billion. So next, next year in Sharm El Sheikh, colleagues. The third point is that we need to undo the damage already done by capturing carbon, replanting rainforests, and rebuilding our communities in a much greener way. Political will must take the hard decisions and not dodge issues for electoral advantage, which we see far too often, that people backslide when it comes to an election. This requires courage, resolve, and long-term thinking. These commodities are too rare in our rancorous, cut-and-thrust, social media-driven political age. Trust is important. If people's trust erodes in governments and leaders, it will erode in us as individual parliamentarians. And I'm sure that's something that none of us want to see. We need to create a sense of common purpose, putting our children's future and the future of the planet above the noise of political debate. To reiterate the words of His Holiness Pope Francis, who many of us met on the 9th of October, we are the stewards of the planet. And as Mary Robinson earlier said, this is an excellent document, and, it, and I believe it's an effective vehicle to take forward this task. It reminds us of our commitments and captures the collective resolve. Responsible stewardship of the planet and the well-being of humanity needs to be at the heart of all political ambition activity. So I beseech you, tomorrow, when you go to the Blue Zone, to take this document with you, to lobby your own country's governments, your own country's negotiators, and to work for the best possible outcome, not with the voice, your individual voice, or the voice of your party or your parliament, but the voice of every single parliament in the world sat behind this document. Let's go forward, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. And as we've heard from Alessia and from Alex, an enormous amount of work has gone into this document. And so the final person that I want to introduce today is a man who literally needs no introduction to all of you. I hope that everyone knows our good friend, Martin Chungong, who has been the Secretary General of uh, the uh, IPU since 2014 and has uh, been to, I think, every single one of these, if not uh, many more before. And Martin, you're going to share with us, now we have this document, what are the next steps for this document? Uh, and I give you the floor, sir, to uh, wrap up this important issue. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ariette. Uh, do, uh, do I take it that we have adopted this document? <laughs> Nobody disagrees. <laughs> Sorry? I, w I was going to suggest that you move that we adopt it, sir. Okay. <laughs> very good. That's a privilege uh, for me. Uh, let me, I know that... Uh, it is me now that is standing between you and your drink during the reception. <laughs> but if you allow me, Ariette, uh, I would like to uh, uh, 
clearly uh, articulate a number of issues just to make sure I do understand. Because tomorrow, uh, the president of the IPO, Duarte, and myself will be asked to take this movement forward. And we want to be sure that we have captured the mood of this meeting here, the sense of this meeting uh, here. I have uh, had a number of things that are heartening to me, and I would like to go back to what uh, President Mary Robinson asked us this morning or this afternoon. Are we in a crisis mood? I can say from the deliberations today that yes, at least as far as parliamentarians are concerned, we are in a crisis mode. We are able to fathom the gravity of the issue that is before us uh, today. And I've seen all throughout our deliberations that there's that desire to bring democracy back into the deliberations, to make sure that multilateralism is center stage in whatever we're doing to address climate change. And we are reminded of this by Senator Galvez, who said we should bring back democracy into our scheme of things. We should be making democracy and multilateralism work in the interest of uh, a healthier uh, planet. That is what I did understand from the discussion today. I said that we are in a crisis mode because lots of words kept, kept coming up in the various interventions we had of now, we had of urgent, we had of speedy action, we had of immediate action, concrete action, resolves, and you have said, Alex, ramping up action in support of a, a healthier atmosphere. And somebody even talked about rates. So we, everything points to the fact that we have to act now. Didn't we hear the Tuvalu lady who said, we need action now? and not next year, yeah. I think it was very clear. And the uh, evidence is there. We had the scientists earlier in the previous session who pointed to scientific evidence which should spur us into action. And if I can mention one of that, that is the uh, latest re uh, scientific report by the World Meteorology Organization on the state of global climate. And that report is very alarming. It says that record atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations and associated accumulated heat have propelled the planet into uncharted territory with far-reaching repercussions for current and future generations. It is a time for parliamentarians to act as, as you said, responsible stewards of the planet and place the well-being of humanity at the heart of all political ambition and activity. And as I say this, I am reminded of what Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, told us the other day in Rome, in October. She said that the planet is our common good, and we as uh, leaders have the moral duty of transferring it in a responsible way to future generations. That is what we are called upon to do uh, as we work towards um, uh, improving upon uh, the uh, life of our planet. And we all have pointed to the core functions of parliament in terms of lawmaking, uh, holding a government to account, providing resources, and generally representing uh, constituents. And I think that this has led us to point to the critical role that parliaments need to play in the implementation of the outcomes of COP26, including domestic climate commitments made through nationally determined con uh, contributions. And while the Paris Agreement is an international treaty, an international agreement, I would like to join those uh, speakers who have taken the floor here to stress that it must be supported by strong national level action to be effective. And this meeting has shown that there is that strong commitment, at least on the part of those who are here, and there's high awareness of the instrumental role that parliaments play in making this happen. Speaker, 
uh, Hoel this morning pointed to a number of things that the House of Commons has been doing. And I would like to commend the UK Parliament on leading by example, on preaching what, uh, doing, acting on what they preach. Thank you very much, Harriet, to you and your colleagues in the uh, House of, uh, uh, in, the, in the British Parliament. And I also am reminded by what he said, uh, Speaker Hoyle, this morning. He said that we missed the train 30 years ago, and it's a pity we're all playing catch up now. If we owe it to future generations to make that catch up work very speedily for the young people whom we saw in this room this morning that the, the Lord Speaker introduced to us uh, earlier in the day. So let me come to the outcome document now. And uh, let me first of all, as you have asked me, Harriet, seek endorsement by the uh, participants here of this outcome document. Do we want to uh, take the sense of this meeting? Do we all say yes to this outcome document? Thank, thank you so much, Martin. Yes, um, let, let me conclude, uh, yeah. Harriet, by saying, and, and again, uh, people, a lot of questions were put to the IPU. The IPU was asked to do a lot of things. And this outcome document is uh, our marching orders. The, right, Duarte? We have received our marching orders. It is our duty as one of the conveners of this meeting to make sure that this document is a living document that we make sure we mobilize parliamentary action in support of all those things that we are saying in this outcome uh, document. So, to borrow from you, uh, Alex, we are going to take this document, uh, Duarte, I speak on our joint behalf, we are going to take this document and table it in our own blue zone. And our own blue zone is the 143rd Assembly of the IPU due to take place in Madrid later this month. So it is a topical issue that we will take with us to um, Madrid. And we will do that again, and I speak on behalf of the president of the IPU, we'll do this, that in the conviction that there can be, the parliaments under the IPU can make a difference. And that is why in the new strategy of the IPU, more prominence is being given to parliamentary action to fight climate change. It has become, if not the top most priority, at least one of the major priorities of the organization going forward. So we will continue not only to create this awareness, but we are supporting, we are going to support uh, countries build their capacity. I had a meeting earlier today with the Vietnamese delegation, and they have adopted uh, climate, uh, or rather an environmental protection law now they need support to implement that law. And I think the IPU can play a role in mobilizing expertise to help them. That is what I think we should be doing too, to walk the talk. And I go back to what Mary Robinson asked us to do, to provide support to the CVF, the Climate Vulnerable Forum. I would like to say that we are already providing that support and uh, uh, Honorary President Chowdhury is here and they can certify that a couple of weeks ago, we did work to launch the parliamentary uh, branch of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. So it is something that ties in with our own strategy and we can do, uh, work uh, in a more robust manner. So to conclude, I would like to echo Sir David Attenborough, who, says, who said, let us be motivated by hope rather than fear to avoid a climate catastrophe. So we know the situation is bad enough, but we shouldn't panic. We should have hope and work robustly towards uh, mitigating the climate crisis as we have heard this. And let me use the opportunity to uh, record the IPU's heartfelt thanks to the British group of the IPU and the Parliament of the UK in general for the strong support and leadership that they have shown throughout this process. They have worked in a very, 
We have worked in a very collaborative manner with the Italian parliament, and we can be uh, heartened by the fact that the outcome is something that, as you say, a global document, a global parliamentary document that we can all uh, uh, throw our weight behind. I want to pay special thanks, uh, give special thanks to Rick and his colleagues. Rick, the uh, director of the British group of the IPU, I know how hard you've been working the sleepless nights and uh, the outcome is there. We uh, can be very proud of our joint work. And so let's leave this room, go home with the strong commitment, the ongoing commitment to keep action alive in the interest of future generations. Again, let me say, let me echo what the Tuvalu lady said. We need action now and not next year. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Martin, and thank you to everyone at the IPU who has helped to get this uh, outcome document uh, adopted. And I would like to add my thanks to our two rapporteurs from the UK and the Italian parliaments for all the hard work that has gone into it. And it's my great pleasure now to say that I declare the outcome document adopted. And it is... <laughs> It is also my great pleasure on behalf of the British group in the IPU to say just what a joy it has been to host these meetings, what a privilege it has been to welcome all of you. And while we're about to declare the formal part of the meeting over, uh, we are very happy to be inviting you upstairs to a drinks reception. And so without more ado, I want to reiterate the commitment of the BGIPU to this work, to the commitment of the BGIPU to the IPU's work in general, and invite you upstairs for a welcome reception. Thank you all very much. <laughs>